Hello and welcome to Distillations, the science, culture, and history podcast. I'm Michal Meyer, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. If you've been to any vintage stores or coffee shops recently, you might have noticed that taxidermy has made a bit of a comeback. Our producer, Mariel Carr, became fascinated by why, and she spent the past few months exploring the alternative, or rogue, taxidermy scene in Philadelphia. Rogue taxidermy takes an artistic approach to the traditional craft and combines materials and even animals in unconventional ways. And it seems to involve a fair amount of glitter. On her journey, Mariel met young, self-taught taxidermists a passionate Victorian taxidermy collector, and the caretaker of the polar bears and gorillas at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Taxidermy has had a long history of combining art and science, and it got a big push forward with the help of chemistry, specifically arsenic. I'm at the third annual alternative taxidermy competition at a vintage social club in Philadelphia. The crowd is mostly mid-twenties to late-thirties, and the style is grown-up goth meets Victorian steampunk. There's a lot of velvet and lace, black hair dye, combat boots, and tattoos. So many tattoos. And the entries are definitely not your run-of-the-mill taxidermy. We've got bio-rabbits, we've got animatronic Everest creatures, we've got a street-performing fox. There's also a suitcase with deer legs, a bird with the head of a rabbit, and a porcupine with antlers. A porculope, if you will. Beth Beverly is the evening's host and a local taxidermist. She's wearing a hat made out of a bird, or maybe two. We started this competition a few years back because I noticed that there was this growing um, community of taxidermy enthusiasts in Philadelphia, and we kind of don't fit into the hunting lodge, uh, deer on the wall type box. Taxidermy seems to be everywhere these days. Every day, a stuffed beaver stares at me from the window of a vintage store on my walk to work, and antlered rabbit heads greet me at my local coffee shop. I wanted to understand why taxidermy was having such a moment, and if taxidermy's made a comeback, where did it go in the first place? And how did this urge to preserve and display dead animals begin? My journey into this new artsy taxidermy world, sometimes called rogue taxidermy, begins with Beth Beverly in her home studio. And the first thing I want to see is her freezer. Kind of, there's a little frostbite. But this is all rabbit carcasses. I have a giant freezer downstairs that is for all my specimen. And I try to just keep the edible stuff in here. Sometimes they um, overlap, but... um, I try to keep it somewhat separated. Beth keeps most of her work in the basement, but from where I'm standing next to the fridge, I can see what looks like a skull cooking on the stove. Ugh, it's awful, isn't it? I can smell it too. I've been burning incense. (laughs) This is something that a regular housemate would not tolerate. We leave the smell behind and go to the basement. I'm pretty curious about that freezer too. Oh, so here is... Beth pries loose a big plastic bag. This is is an ostrich. Upstairs, there's a peacock and a deer head on the couch, a bat in the window, and a baby goose with glittery butterfly wings hanging on the wall. Downstairs is all works in progress. At the moment, I'm working on a pet hedgehog named Pepper. Usually, I'll start with a whole animal and depending on what I want to do, um, I'll either cut it down the front or down the back. I usually prefer to do a dorsal cut because when you put the foramen, you can almost imagine like dropping it into it. It's a lot easier to fit the skin to it. But for this guy, there's no way that I'm going to be able to sew this back up without destroying my hands. Basically, it's a lot like just trying to take a jacket and a pair of socks off of something and peeling all the skin off the carcass. At this point, Beth sends her skins to a professional tanner who takes them through a multi-day, eight-step process. 
The skin gets salted and dried, and then washed and degreased in what is essentially dishwashing soap. Then it's pickled with an acid like formic, oxalic, or sulfuric acid. The pickling swells the skin so the pores shrink and lock in the fur. Finally, the skin is soaked in a tanning solution made up of a combination of aluminum-based chemicals like lutan or alum. And then it's oiled. In the end, the hide is basically leather, just like a belt or a shoe, that still has its fur. Without the tanning, the skin would still be like flesh that a bug or another creature might want to eat. And you just have to fit it and fit it until you get it really right. You take out all of the meat and the bones and you just have a skin, a tanned hide, and then you arrange it over some sort of form, sometimes made out of foam or wood, a mannequin really. And then the skin goes onto the form, you sew it up, and then kind of there's a lot of pinning in place, especially around the face. And then a lot of times, unless it's somebody's pet or if it's roadkill, I will try to eat the meat from whatever I've skinned. That's just my own philosophy of not wasting anything. Having grown up vegetarian in the animal rights loving 90s, this is all a little new and a little strange. But I realized that Beth didn't hunt any of these animals. In fact, she feels she's rescued them from sadder and less meaningful ends. But this isn't how taxidermy always happened. If you go back far enough, you could say taxidermy's predecessor was mummification, which the Egyptians started doing around 3400 BCE. Like taxidermy, mummification was about fighting the inevitable, preserving a body after its death. Thousands of years later, the desire to preserve bodies continued among other cultures. Just think of religious relics. But the urge to preserve preceded the ability to actually do it well. The first actual taxidermy came in the 13th century, when falconers crudely stuffed birds to use them as hunting and trapping decoys. Holy Roman Emperor Friedrich II detailed his pretty basic technique in his book on the art of hunting with birds. Number one, take wing off bird. Number two, remove flesh. Number three, rub inside skin with potash to prevent decay and maggots. Number four, hang wing and chimney to dry. By the so-called age of exploration, starting in the 15th century, the taxidermy impulse really got going in Europe. And it was all about curiosity in a world that was simultaneously expanding and shrinking. It wasn't enough to simply tell stories about exotic creatures and plants from these new to European lands. In this pre-photography, pre-internet age, people at home wanted to see the actual goods. The problem though was that they were organic and they couldn't make the long journeys intact. Naturalists prescribed various methods over the years, including using substances like alcohol, seawater, salt, spices, and powders to prevent decay, as well as baking specimens in the sun or even ovens to dry them out. But nothing worked very well until a scientific breakthrough in the mid 18th century forever changed the practice. And it paved the way for the golden age of Victorian taxidermy making and collecting. It was arsenic. This would have been the entertainment center in your parlor. The first movement are the hummingbirds. And here you see the hummingbirds are jumping from branch to branch, singing their little hummingbird song. In the lower left, you have a bird that is eating. And then you have the warbling bird. He takes a drink and sings his little heart out. Now, if all of that wasn't enough, we're going to add some music. I'm in the second floor parlor of John White Knight's home, watching and listening to one of his two wind-up musical taxidermy pieces. You can't really explore the history of taxidermy and not look into the Victorian era. And luckily for me, there just happened to be a Victorian taxidermy collector right here in Philadelphia. When you're a collector, more or less you want one of everything, or sometimes two. My name is John White Knight, and I have been a collector and a lover of all things Victorian for well over 40 years. The bug bit when I was 18 years old, and it has been biting ever since very heavily. 
The majority of John's taxidermy collection sits under glass domes. Hummingbirds, toucans, parrots, a peacock, a flamingo, pheasants. The big birds, they're by James Gardner from about 1870. They're magnificent, <laughs> by the way. And one passenger pigeon, the only extinct animal he owns. There's also a monkey, a goat, and three dogs. This is a uh, Fond du Lac, and the one behind you is Miguelito. And um, <laughs> downstairs, the Yorkie is named Cedric. John's house could easily be a museum. His collection fills four stories and includes not only taxidermy, but furniture, shell art, wax art, and that bizarre Victorian craze, hair art. So there they are. And John is dressed the part in a velvet tuxedo with a complicated collar he periodically fusses with. Stupid tie. On his lapel is a pin made from the paw of some small animal. I'm guessing a lamb. And everything, including the taxidermy, is stunning and faithfully Victorian. With good reason. Most of the specimens before the 19th century were presented in a rather stiff manner with very little animation. So I call it the rigor mortis look. So what changed? John James Audubon. He was the one that took birds and mammals and put them in very animated poses. So no longer were birds just standing there looking wide-eyed, you know, straight ahead. Their wings were spread. Their beaks were open on paper and under glass. And the other part of it, too, is the whole chemistry of it was changing. Animals could be preserved more readily with the use of arsenic. The importance of arsenic in taxidermy's history can't be overstated. It was a major game changer. Taxidermy has to fight decay and pests. And arsenic is a highly toxic chemical element that's also a really effective insecticide. For years, taxidermists struggled to preserve their creations. Finally, in 1738, a French ornithologist named Jean-Baptiste Becur ran 50 chemical trials on 50 specimens to determine the effectiveness of a formula that combined arsenic with camphor, potassium carbonate, powdered calcium hydroxide, and soap. It became known as arsenical paste, and it was so effective, Bakur kept it a secret for the rest of his life. So where did people get all of this arsenic? It was readily available. If you went to any 19th century apothecary, it was there for you. Arsenic was a huge byproduct of the Industrial Revolution, specifically the mining industry. In fact, when government inspectors visited a smelter in Cornwall, England in the 1870s, they saw, quote, a quantity of arsenic sufficient to destroy every living animal upon the face of the earth. It turned out it was just one factory's output for one month. I start wondering what this means for John's collection. Hopefully most of those that have survived uh, moth damage and insect damage, they were dosed per rather heavily. And do you worry about that at all? No, not at all. How come? Most of the specimens are contained under glass and um, a lot of taxidermists lived to ripe old ages in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So I don't worry about it for a second. I would be more worried about the content of formaldehyde in all the products that are coming into our homes rather than worrying about an antique piece of taxidermy. Victorian taxidermy was based in science, both in the techniques used to make it and the natural history it honored and displayed. But there was also an element of showing off about it. Most of the people that did this collecting were not scientists. They were merchants, they were aristocrats. You wanted to show people when you had pe people come to your home that you were aware of the natural world. You looked at the natural world, you studied the natural world, you appreciated the natural world, and therefore you wanted to be surrounded by the natural world. Of all John's pieces, perhaps the most famous and definitely the most fun is The Monkey Riding a Goat by Walter Potter. A goat poses in front of a painted landscape while a monkey sits on top of him on a saddle, whip in hand, baby blue tie around his neck. Now the story goes that this is a goat from Whiston Park, which is a big manor house. And this goat was constantly breaking out of its paddock. Well, unfortunately one day it broke out for the last time and it was hit by a team of horses and the goat was killed. The monkey was a pet in a nearby town 
and the monkey was notorious for stealing fruit from the green grocer. So one day the green grocer saw the monkey come and he took a bucket of ice water and he dumped it on the monkey. The monkey went into shock and died of a heart attack. So Mr. Potter thought it was only appropriate that these two rascals should be sent off into the sunset in perpetuity. In a way, John is retracing the steps of a Victorian collector, displaying these objects for all his guests to enjoy. But they really mean something to him too. Our house is not inanimate to us, nor are these, these things. Most of these things were created 150, 100 years ago. What has gone past them? Who have they seen? Who have they witnessed? There's nothing cold or nothing frightening about it. It's just wonderful. My name is Jennifer Sanchi. I'm the Senior Director of Exhibits and Public Spaces at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. As the taxidermy under glass trend died out with the Victorian era, 20th century natural history museums picked it up, went bigger, and put animals behind glass. That same curiosity that motivated 16th century explorers to search out new lands and collect foreign species continued into the 1900s. But instead of collecting dainty hummingbirds, natural history museum dioramas presented animals like polar bears, zebras, and gorillas in their natural habitats. And I have to say, even today when I can easily look up thousands of photographs of these animals online, there's something thrilling about standing inches away from a polar bear who could definitely kill me if it were alive. So right next to you is uh, a polar bear diorama. This is our moose diorama. One of the original motivations behind these dioramas was a new public concern about conservation in the early to mid 20th century. There was a, a sort of all of a sudden an understanding that perhaps we didn't have infinite resource you know, to, to exploit as an American uh, public. Um, the, the buffalo that were darkened, the hills were thinning, etc. Ironically, natural history museums addressed these environmental concerns by going all over the world and killing a lot of animals, some of which no longer exist except on display in these cases. And there was a bit of a macho vibe behind the whole thing. Carl Akeley was a famous taxidermist in the late 19th century who revolutionized the habitat diorama with his attention to anatomical correctness and lightweight mannequins. But he might be best remembered for punching a leopard to death with his bare hands. From the inside of the leopard, after it attacked him and was on its way to eating his arm and probably the rest of him. Creating these dioramas was a really elaborate process that involved a lot of people and a lot of money. What they would do is they would form a expedition. Everyone from the museum director to scientists to artists to benefactors would go off to places like Africa. Many, if not all, of these dioramas are an actual place where you could stand and see that backdrop and those animals. Sometimes if they were in a dangerous area, they might have a hunter looking out for them to make sure that they weren't ambushed by dangerous animals. And then what they would do is they would collect, is the kind word for shoot, and they took ex very detailed measurements of all of those, of those particular animals. Then they would skin them and bring everything back to the museum. But for all the detailed documenting and measuring, there's a surprising amount of creative license taken with these dioramas. Take the gorilla case. There's a huge male gorilla, one hairy arm over his head, brow furrowed, glaring at what I assume is some unidentified foe in the distance. Below him, crouching on all fours, is a female gorilla, his wife, if you will. And all the way to the right is a baby gorilla, eating berries. So we have a lot of symbolic uh, storytelling elements here, telling us that this is a family. Uh, with, a f with a father in charge of the family, who is he's defending the family. The funniest thing about this is this is not how gorillas actually live. They are generally solitary males. They are not particularly aggressive. But nobody wanted that story. What they wanted was the story of the capturing and controlling this gorilla. Even though people still visit the Academy of Natural Sciences 45 dioramas every day, they're not making any new ones. 
Over the years, laws and environmental views changed, and people just didn't need museums to bring the world to them in the same way anymore. TV and the internet kind of did that. So for years, it was all kind of passé at best. At worst, people like John White Knight were sharply criticized for the animals mounted on their walls. And then, a few years ago, something started to change. I think I first noticed it when I gave one of my first presentations and all of a sudden I was seeing younger people in these audiences. And I just knew that something's going on here. Why are, why are these young people, why are they here? Today's rogue taxidermists are on the opposite end of the collecting spectrum from natural history museum dioramas. No one I meet is wrestling leopards. No one is going to Africa to hunt gorillas. Actually, no one is hunting at all. For them, it's more about becoming familiar with the wildlife that surrounds us every day. This is how Beth Beverly got her start. I was the window dresser for Daffy's and not necessarily the store windows, but all the buildings around birds would fly into them and you'd see them on the sidewalk. It just, it broke my heart that people would either just kick them to the side or step on them. And so I just bought this vintage book on how to do taxidermy and I started picking the birds up and taking them home. And then, um, rumor gets around town that if you see a dead bird, call this girl because she'll come pick it up. And so I just started collecting like seagulls and pigeons and sparrows and starlings. And then I actually found out much, much later that it's completely illegal to collect a lot of those birds. They're all protected, but I didn't know that at the time. And then I just practiced and practiced and practiced and then started buying bird, like whole pheasants from the butcher. It's a Monday night in February, and Beth is showing a room of University of the Arts students how to mount rabbit heights. Remember all those rabbit carcasses from Beth's freezer? This is where all of their skin went. The class is all women, a few college students and a lot of staff members, including art professors from the school. One woman tenderly strokes her rabbit's nose, while the woman next to her is figuring out how to attach her rabbit head to the body of a plastic doll. What inspired you to make this? Um, I photograph creepy dolls. <laughs> That's your main thing? Yeah, and I collect taxidermy. You know, though, I have pet rabbits. <laughs> how is this process for you? It's been a little rough with the head. When I look straight into its face, I'm vegetarian too. Did you tell anyone, like, hey, I'm taking this class, I'm a vegetarian, I have pet rabbits, and I'm going to did anyone think that was odd? Yes, everybody I talked to. Right. <laughs> Sonia McCormick is another student in the class. She's a junior at UArts and dabbled in taxidermy on her own before taking this class, mostly with the pigeons hanging around her apartment. I think what's really great about taxidermy is it allows people to get closer to these animals that are very skittish or rare. I'm back at the competition, and I spot both John White Knight and Sony McCormick among the tattooed velvet and lace crowd. I'm here because it's all about taxidermy, and I can see by the look of the other entrants that I'm here to represent a bit more of the traditional. I ask John what he thinks of the pieces. My preference is traditional taxidermy, you know, done well, done beautifully, but I'm just excited because of this whole revival. I know that they are rogue taxidermists, and um, they're artists, and they're using taxidermy in their own way, as their own art form. So, you know, I'm open to that. But uh, do they know? Do they have a, a real working historical perspective? I don't know. As the night wears on, people shop for jewelry made out of bones and teeth and keychains fashioned from raccoon tails. Sonia McCormick wins the Audience Award for the rabbit she made in Beth's class. And the evening's winner is Karen for her porculope, who says this when she wins. Recently, I was struck by an insight that brought me to my knees. I am continually drawn to the broken, damaged, and often mangled forms of animals whose lives have been cut short, often in violent ways. When I am able to rescue these lifeless forms and create something new, it feels like a personal triumph. 
Each creature I touch is a little piece of my soul. You may see something morbid, disgusting, and broken. I see the potential and opportunity that hides beneath the battered bodies. Working with blood, flesh, and bone is an intimate and organic process. In the hours I spend with each dead animal, a personal connection develops that borders on love. Every time it works, when something is preserved and made new, my soul claims a victory. I heal myself with every scrape and stitch. I'm guessing that a lot of people in the room can relate to her statement. And I realized that a small part of me had just the assumptions she's describing when I set out on this journey. That something about this whole trend was morbid or disgusting. But I don't see it that way anymore. Instead, these days when I pass that beaver in the window, I see the incredible skill and science and craft that goes into it. And I also see the many ways that humans have thought about and interacted with the natural world throughout time. For Distillations, I'm Mariel Carr.